we are talking about a lab that is trying to reshape human civilization and may be on track to do so. The fact that there is opacity of almost any kind regarding the running of that lab, regarding like, like the, in any other circumstance, like I think the average American looking at this would be like, I feel like I should know. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I just feel like. Yeah, well, if you're messing with my destiny, my future, yeah. and my humanity, I need to know, guys. Uh, welcome to the podcast Off Limits with Children in the Background. <laughs> I this like is this the, yeah, we the, the things we talk about on this podcast are off limits, so I decided to call it Off Limits. Um, but I read your book, so we have Jeremy Harris and Ron Harris, Ed close. Harris, Very Ed Harris, close. Ed Harris. Ed and Ron are always, you know, but you guys, can you explain before we get into all of this? Cause I want to touch on AI. I want to talk about how quantum physics, uh, is at this point in history, probably crucial to get right. Good luck with that. Your book, your book is the first book that actually broke down quantum physics in a way I could understand. So well, bravo. You. And also, uh, it, it, it f left me. Uh, believe it in God, but hopeless at the same time. So we're going to get into all this stuff. But I, I, what I want to do is kind of, can you guys tell us what you do and how in AI? Talk to, talk to us. No. No. <laughs> it's too top secret. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I guess we can start, I mean, we can start with a little bit of, the, yeah, the back, backstory on how, how we got here in the AI world. And mm -hmm. I think the, the quantum physics piece is kind of like a side project that was going on, you know, on the side for a couple of years. Um, but then intersected in this weird way that you just kind of alluded to. So I guess for starters, we're both physicists by training. That's kind of where all this starts. Where the quantum and AI kind of comes in. Yeah, okay. exactly. So dropped out of, I dropped out of grad school. He actually finished his PhD. So, you know. Oh, actually, damn. You have a PhD. Uh, doctor. I, I, doctor S. I regret it uh, because it was a waste of time relative to starting a company earlier. But yeah. You yeah. can call me. You can call me Doctor from this point forward. That's like the one <laughs> consolation prize. So Thank you. Thank you. The young doctor. <laughs> so good. shortly after Doctor Ed uh, finished his PhD, yeah, um, doing that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. We, so we started basically our first AI startup like in 2015. Had no idea what we were doing, and failed our way to greater and greater failure. And uh, eventually, we managed to fail all the way into Y Combinator, which is like the startup accelerator in you know uh, Mountain View where a lot of early stage companies go, that's where we cut our teeth, kind of learned how startups were made. And also where we started to talk to a lot of people who then went on to work at OpenAI, went on to work at like Google DeepMind, stuff like that. Um, Sam Altman was actually the president of uh, YC at the time we went through. So, you know, we saw him give like the opening statement, had some conversations with him as part of the batch. And so that was kind of cool. Um, YC is also really kind of linked in socially mm -hmm. with OpenAI. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of like weird overlap and kind of OpenAI fun. went through YC. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But you know, <clears throat> I watched Tristan Harris and uh, as a Raskin, I think uh, I think those are her names, and th th it it was a terrifying podcast on Rogan because there is, and you guys would probably agree, that anyone in this space knows that within a decade, two decades, maybe less, we are going to have essentially human level AI but maybe superhuman AI. And that's a very dangerous idea because we're making computers that seem to have the cognitive ability that humans do and beyond. Is this what's going on? The people at the Frontier Labs that we speak to think that it could be significantly sooner than that. And there's actually a really good reason to believe that too. This actually ties into that story. Like, so in 2020, there was this paper that came out. It was like a, just an academic almost paper from OpenAI. Um, where they talked about these things that they called scaling laws. And it was basically this idea that, like up until that point, the way you made progress in AI was you got fancier and fancier with your, your like algorithms, with the way that you create your artificial brains, basically. Uh, but in 2020, what people started to really realize was, wait a minute, like maybe we don't need to keep going fancier. Maybe we just need bigger. Maybe bigger is better. Mm. Maybe like a bigger, basically artificial brain with more moving parts, powered by more computing power. And we're talking like, tens, hundreds, billions of dollars in computing budget, in just these advanced processors. Maybe that's all you need to basically get to human level AI. And once Ed saw that, actually, he read that paper, we had like this panicked two hour phone conversation where he's like, dude, like this, like this paper seems to be the real deal. Like it looks like we're on the way. I try to argue him out of it. Frankly, I was like in denial at the time. 
and he just like re- like wrestled me into submission and because you guys were waiting for some kind of a new chip some kind of a breakthrough in material sciences or quantum science but but in fact it just was it was just really about more muscle power yeah like some sort mm-hmm. of oh super smart algorithm that's going to you know beat everything through some discovery but the reality is like no it's just i mean there's some nuance to it obviously but the core of it is just make these systems bigger and bigger and bigger and if you think about it, that's kind of a scary thought because it means that the bigger you make a system, the smarter, the more capable it gets, the more money you can make with it, right? GPT-4 can make, make it a lot more money than GPT-3.5 and the GPT-3. And then you can take that money and use it to directly reinvest in a more scaling or to raise money, investor money, to invest in a more scaling. And so you're closing that loop. Hmm. You literally have a loop that like pumps money in and like pushes out IQ points, something close to IQ points, it's pretty fucked up. And then and then you'll start having AI making AI. That is... That's the exponential issue. That's like... That's on the roadmap-ish. It's explicitly of, on the... I mean, like... Yeah. The, so OpenAI's current roadmap, just to step back a little bit. So yeah, it is explicitly on the roadmap. You're right. It, it is, yeah. So you've got essentially this dial you can think of tuning, right? Scale. Throw... Turn dollars into IQ points, basically. Like throw computing power at your system, buy processors from you know these companies and scale. Um, the problem is that's a dial for capabilities, dial for intelligence. It's not a dial for control, for safety, for predictability, for liability, for truthfulness. All the things that we actually want our systems to manifest. We know how to increase the IQ of these systems, basically, but not how to make them more aligned with what we want. And what started to happen is more and more we've gotten evidence pile up that actually the default course, if you make systems beyond a certain level of intelligence, by default, they might have some really kind of concerning properties. So one of them is known as power seeking, which it's a dramatic sounding term, but it actually kind of maps on to what, what is meant. So the idea here is, you know, you have an AI system, it's trained by a glorified version of trial and error. Try to do a thing, fail, try again, rejigger yourself a little bit and see what happens. You're working towards an objective in that process. And no matter what your goal is, no matter what goal you give the system, <clears throat> It's very rare. There's almost no situation where it's better off achieving that goal if it gets turned off. Yeah. Or if it has access to fewer resources. If it's less intelligent. It, like you, you have to come up with like really specific goals. Like the vast majority of goals, they don't work like that. It's basically got an implicit objective that's baked into the mathematical premise of modern AI to do all these things, to behave yeah. adversarially in a way a lot of people think <clears throat> relative to human beings. Yeah. Well, will it have any respect for its biological heritage? There's Ray no Kurzweil way. was talking about this, you know, when I read his book, The Singularity is Near. But the, the, the larger sort of question really becomes, is, is it possible? So I, I, see, I found your book fascinating because you seem to have broken down the fundamental debate in quantum physics. And I understand why you say getting your PhD was a waste of time in some ways because you're living in a world of theory in subatomic particles and atomic particles. You're living in the why is this? Why is 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 light a wave? Is it a particle? Is it is it you know the same thing? Is it two different things? Is it you know the the opposite of the other? And do, are they both two halves? I mean, there are a thousand questions. Um, I thought Niels Bohr's zombie cat example was fascinating you know it's that an electron can go the counterclockwise and clockwise at the same time and if you put a cat in a box and you have a gun and every time the the electron goes counterclockwise you hear a click and that click trigger triggers the gun to shoot the cat and the cat dies but here's the thing the, the electron is also going counterclockwise. And as a result, as it moves counterclockwise, the click doesn't go off. And so the gun doesn't kill the cat. Two things are happening at the same time. The cat is undead. It's dead. It's not dead. It's dead. And, and, and what, what really freaked out or the, the central, the, the, the main thing is why when a human being observes that cat, does the cat collapse at, into death or into life? And when, if we're made of atoms and everything else is made of atoms, how is it that this at atomic structure is able to collapse yeah. a cat into either dead or alive? And the only answer is maybe there's something about human perception 
the human experience that is something like consciousness. Consciousness, whether it's individual consciousness or universal consciousness, is um, other. It, it, it's not made of atoms. It's it's immeasurable at this point, anyway, right? Is am I am I in the area of of what we're talking about when it comes to crazy quantum fucking <laughs> mysticism? Because I love how you're like, well, it could be quantum. There are quantum mystics. It's all quantum. It's all mysticism. Um, th <clears throat> thank you, Deepak. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, just so you know, I'm in Gathswani's uh, camp. So, yeah, you are. Yeah. I, I believe in universal consciousness because that's my aesthetic preference. Yeah. I so. believe in. I believe there's got to be a god. So so legit, so okay, a couple things there. Like first of all, um, yes, I think one of the the really interesting things about quantum mechanics, and it ties into the AI picture in a way we can explore. Yeah, later, this is what but, I need to know. Yeah, yeah, no, but like, so one of the really interesting things about it is it does force us to like reconcile ourselves to f facts about the world that seem contradictory, right? You mentioned you know, we do have evidence that suggests that particles seem to be able to behave as if they're doing many different mutually contradictory things at the same time. Yeah. Right. Electrons spinning clockwise and cl counterclockwise at the same time, for yeah. example. Which is so crazy. Which is crazy. Yeah. The I'm going to need both of you to explain before you go into this, after, after you do this, w why you know that an electron can be in two different places at the same time, as in w a different universe. Because, huh? But hold that. Put that marker in there. Keep going. Okay. So, so <clears throat> actually, you know what? That's probably a good place to start, though. Okay. Because that's kind of at the root. There, there are only two weird things about quantum mechanics, and the first one is this idea that particles, like electrons, can do many different things. So, so where the hell? How do how do we get there? Right. Right. Um, for electrons, the experiments are really hard to explain. However, I'll give it to you for light. That's how we know the particles of light, photons, do this. Okay. So take a a sheet of paper mm -hmm. and punch two holes in it, really close together then shine a laser beam on those holes. Look out the other end. One more thing, you're gonna cover one of those holes. So light's just going through hole number one. On the other end, you're gonna see a, a blotch of light, right? The light that went through that first hole. Cool, nothing too surprising. Okay, cover that hole, open up the other one. Now you're gonna see another blotch of light lined up with the other hole. Mm -hmm. No surprise, light goes through holes, no shit. Now, if you take both of those um, holes and you open them both up at the same time, what do you think is going to happen? You have interference. Fucking read the book. Okay. <laughs> now, if you were not Brian Callen. Where's my audience? Yeah. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. Damn it. Sorry. You just, no, but, but you see. Like, you I don't see go to your different... shows and yell the punchline, Brian. So, okay. So, it's so messed up. <laughs> but you'd see. So, so you shine the light through the two holes now. Yeah. You would see a different pattern. Right. Well, so yeah. And, and most people would expect like, okay, well, I'll just see two, two bright spots. That's right? what I would expect. Right. Right. Except nature says, yeah, go fuck yourself. Uh, I'm going to yeah. put a bunch of weird shit that looks nothing like what you should have expected. And then the only explanation really is like, okay, some, somehow there's like a, a mixing effect going on yeah. here. There's got to be some weird interaction between the light that's going through those two holes that gives us something that's different from what otherwise the sum of its parts, what we just should have expected otherwise. Right. Blotch, blotch. Um, so th then the question is like, okay, fine. That's just how light behaves. It starts to mix with itself when you have two holes. Einstein then comes around. He's like, well, hold on a minute. Uh, turns out light is not actually just light. It's made of particles. So you go, okay, it's made of particles. No big deal. The particles from the two holes must be mixing together in some right. weird way. Um, but then people go, well, wait a minute. If that's happening, I should be able to dim my light source to the point where there's a single photon going through the whole system at any given time. Just one particle right. of light. Surely if that's happening, it can't interfere with itself it can't interact with itself like that yeah. photon's got to pick one hole or the other to sure. go through so i should go back to seeing one blotch and another blotch mm -hmm. no mixing no interaction that's not what they see they see the same freaking weird messed up pattern as before but there's only one particle of light going through the whole system and they're able to know that it's just one particle they're yeah. able to yeah. know that they can, can just dim it down to yeah, one photon you can dim it down to the point where you just have one photon wow you, you can build detectors that will click with one photon. How, how, how do we know that? How, when did that happen? Well, one thing is you can literally just like look at the screen on the other side and observe as one little kind of blotch of the photon hits a uh, particle and then it yeah. has a chemical reaction and lights okay. up, let's say, yeah. It's like old timey TV sets with like the electron gun. You can like, basically yeah. it's like a, a phosphorescent thing. And if one photon hits, you see a flash Got and it. that tells you it's just Got a it. That's interesting. Okay. So so you dim it down to one photon, but even when you shoot one photon out, it's still mixing. It's still mixing. So now people are like, what the fuck? So they're looking at the system and kind of going, okay, first of all, what the fuck? 
Second, how could that photon be interacting with, well, is it interacting with itself? Like, is it going, is that one photon going through both of those slits? That's the only way we could explain the pattern to begin with. So the conclusion based on that experiment, and by the way, like a giant mountain of other experiments that show the same thing, but mm -hmm. in just like different settings. Mm -hmm. Basically, we, we now know that this seems, particles at least seem to behave as if this is what's going on. It's true for photons. By the way, you can repeat that same experiment with electrons. And you can, you know, same thing with, with other particles. So this seems to be a weird thing about the laws of nature that they not only permit, but it's more than that, encourage particles to do this weird kind of multiple personality disorder thing where they're in many different places at once, spinning in many different directions at once. And the craziest thing is like, if you try to pin them down to one location, they're going to fight you. They're going to try to spread out. Really? That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Basically, you take a particle, put it in a spot, and that particle is going to go like, well, you're sure about where I am right now, right? You go, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, okay, well, eh, fuck you. I stretch out, and now you don't know where I am. Over time, they gradually uh, there's relax. A like there's a trade-off in how much you're allowed to know. Not how much you can measure, but how much the universe lets you know about where something is versus how fast it's moving. And so the more sure you are about where something is, the more like wonkly fast it moves around and vice versa. The it's, more sure you are. Yes. Think of it as a- So weird. It's, it's like a it's quarter nanometer. No wonder, no wonder you guys as quantum physicists get into philosophy and the meaning of life because it's impossible not to. Like, yeah. you, like whatever you think is true, you know, see this is where we get crazy because this is where we get into determinism versus fatalism. This is where we get into free will and does it exist. So what's going on is that these these laws are the way that reality works, but they're counterintuitive because the intuitions we have about everyday stuff are built up on top of these weird wonky things at a scale that makes them feel totally different qualitatively. And so when we dig deep enough, we just see this utterly alien landscape. But that's like that's the reality. But see, so it's very possible to ignore quantum physics. It's one of the things that as a regular person who lives in this Newtonian world, yeah. uh, and, and there is a, there's a side of Newtonian physics that's true. And I live in that world. Yeah. I live in the idea of time. I live in the idea of working hard and I'll get benefits. I work yeah. in the world of free will. That's how my justice system is based. So everything like that works for me. But it seems to me that your book is suggesting and you guys are suggesting in these AI labs that... That is no longer a luxury we can afford. Somehow, quantum physics is is having is bearing more relevance on AI. Well, I just want to distinguish. So the book itself is sort of like a passion project on quantum physics. Yeah, but it's distinct from like the Frontier Labs are, aren't like roping in AI. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, quantum physics in their. They're not. They're not. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, your your idea was from the book was. How we decide the the story we tell about the world, yeah. and how we interpret quantum mechanics, yeah. is is really a big. So so if you, if you said well the world's deterministic, if you can see that the Big Bang and that bang has just there's a, it's it's not a chain of coincidences. It's actually a chain of reaction. So whatever you're going to do is predetermined. People go, what's the point of doing anything? What's yeah. the point of working hard? It's it's already written down. It's just, we get into Calvinism and all that stuff, yeah. right? Um. So, so that was that was more your passion project about about the idea that what I liked about the book is I realized that nobody's really come very, nobody's gotten closer to any sense of why electrons behave this way, etc. Yeah, and, and actually, so this is where it ties into I think the practicalities of like where we're going with AI too. Yeah. So okay, the year is like um, call it actually the year is today. We've been sitting with the same uh, data set for a really long time in quantum physics. The same set of experiments, same data. Over time, we've been chewing on that data more and more. We've been thinking about it more, coming up with new ways to explain it. Now, it turns out each of those new ways, that's a new scientific hypothesis, kind of, and they all fit the data. And the longer you sit there accumulating more and more hypotheses, the more you realize, holy shit, there's like a potentially infinite number of ways of explaining the same static data set. And so the more you idle with it, the, the longer you real, the more you realize like, whoa, the, the process of science, I mean, if you view it as, as just this thing that leads to one explanation that gets you like the definitive picture of the world, that's not actually what's going on here. Like many, many scientific explanations can fit the observable reality. 
So now we had a conversation when we went down to one of the, the frontier labs um, with the, the government team that we're working with. And one of the things they highlighted was something similar is happening with AI. We face the very real prospect of building systems that can um, effectively automate AI research and improve themselves, right? Now, whatever you've established in terms of safety with these systems, yeah. whatever you think you know- Is now autonomous. Right, and like whatever theory you've come up with, yeah. right? Like I have a theory that I can prove explains the data that I have, that explains all the behaviors of AI systems that I've seen my whole life, right? Well, what if you just waited another 10 years? You'd have another theory. And those theories, they all fit the data in the same uh, data set that we've seen so far. But with data that we haven't seen, the predictions start to flop yeah. like at the edges like crazy. So this this is like what you were mentioning. You're in Newton's world, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you look at like how what Newton came up with, like in terms of mechanics and how things move and gravity why. and motion, all of that stuff. Yeah. And it works. 99% of the time. In fact, it works so well that you and I don't need to care about any refinements in our day to day. But the reality is deeper than that. And the reality of mechanics or something closer to the reality of mechanics than Newton is general relativity. And that was Einstein several hundred years later. And the, the, um, the leap from the Newtonian to the Einstein mechanics is a fundamental like mathematical refactoring of the whole basis of everything to do with mechanics and gravity. That is measurably true. Yes. Yeah. And it was only realized that this had to be done because of a few small deviations in the experimental results or, that they collected over hundreds of years. Now you think about what Jeremy said here about you get systems that can self-improve. Today, we don't have any theories for why AI systems do what they do. So we don't know what's going on inside, what their motivations may or may not be, even what their capabilities are. We can't map that out. Suppose that we got there and we actually, you know, got beyond where we are today and we can, we have a, per, like what we think, right, is a perfect theory of the intentions and, and uh, capabilities of AIs today. Amazing. That's like an amazing, amazing accomplishment. But now... We go to the next level and we have systems that can automate AI development and self-improve, right? There's no reason, certainly there's no reason why that can't happen. Certainly, again, that's explicitly on the roadmap of many of these labs. Now you have a point where once you pass the point where AI systems can start to self-improve, you know, you run that cycle once. Okay, now you've got a smarter system. Well, surely that system is now smart enough to self-improve itself even more. So like quickly you get a smarter system. And then it's like, where, where does that process end? It's actually not clear that there are limitations to that outside of just the fundamental laws of physics. And like, what I think is very interesting is that, that machines have a proclivity to improve. Now we have to define yeah. what improve is, but they have a proclivity to grow to, you know, it's like you can say human beings have, uh, everybody wants to get better and everybody needs help. Uh, you know, th there's an area of your life I can help you with, and you're going to listen. There's an area, and we all want to self improve. And, you yeah, know, th th that's yeah. An, now you want to get into Zen. You know, Alan Watts would say any sensible person realizes that you can't improve yourself and you can't improve the world. And do gooders cause all the problems? Okay, we can get into that stuff too. I like that. Mean, meaning, leave yourself alone. It's a process of deletion, not addition. And okay, we can get into that. But, but that's that to me is th th why these systems seem to want more. Like human beings want more. There seems to be a built-in greed. Well, the, right, or, or, now, or, or no. right now, um, we are the ones who want to make these systems more powerful. Because that's where all we the, are the ones. Like because all the economics, yeah. right, are pushing. It, so it's economic that. incentives. Oh, for now, yeah, yeah for now, and, and totally, and very strong ones. By and, the way. and this is where the government and you guys come in, which is the government says, "Hey, guys, uh, this is dangerous. You're not aware of what you're creating because you may not be able to control it." And they can't control the race that they're in either. So you've got OpenAI, you've got Google DeepMind, you've got Anthropic. All of these labs working as hard and as fast as they can to build, you know, as powerful AI systems as they as they possibly can, as quickly as they can. Yeah. If one of them bows out because they're like, hey, we're doing some dangerous shit here, the other two are still going. Of course. So like you've kind of And so um, do, and so other countries are they have an incentive to steal too. it or do it as well. And, and that, the, the yes. story too behind the founding of those labs is like a case in point. So it, it's actually hilarious. It, it's yeah. hilariously sad. I mean, so you start off with like basically 2014 
and Demis Asabis goes in co and co-founds DeepMind, Google DeepMind. Sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. that's the acquisition, that's right, 2010, um, with the goal of building human-level AI, or AGI. Um, then Elon basically has a conversation after uh, DeepMind is you know, in the process of getting acquired by Google, he has a conversation with- um, Sergey Brin. Sergey Brin, yep. and he's like, uh, I don't know if I trust this guy, I'm gonna fund a competitor lab, you know, which became OpenAI with Sam Altman, and then a few years later, a bunch of folks on the OpenAI safety and policy teams go, uh, this is where we get into a, big, a bit of fog of war, right? We don't know the exact reasons, but it does seem to be for safety reasons. They decided to move off and found Anthropic. So now we have, you know, this like multiplication of the different players in the race, exacerbating the race dynamics. Why, why do you think when you're working in, on an AI brain, what is, what is the... Um What's the watershed moment where you realize this is getting dangerous? There may not be yeah. a clear watershed moment, and that's one of the major concerns. Because keep in mind as well that you're training these systems for competence. And in particular, right now, one of the ways that folks are training these systems is like, give it a thumbs up when it gives a good answer, give it a thumbs down when it gives a bad answer. Does that train for truth? No. Up to a point, well, but maybe. like, uh, but, but certainly Gemini would would beg to disagree. Yeah, that's yeah. that's right. If that's I, right. I put a Nazi and I get a, a black dude in a totally, Nazi. Totally. Like, what the fuck? So like, so that, Google, that, Google DeepMind, like, you think they didn't spend tens of millions of dollars trying to characterize their system? This is one, yeah. and this is one of, of the most capable companies in the world. Sure. And this is the best that they could do. Right. That should scare you. Yeah, but my question to you guys is that, as the government and as you guys and a lot of you guys like Tristan Harris and you guys go, hey. This is this is this. Well, I'm working on this system, which is software. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's able to do all these things. What? Give me an example of where an AI engine, where 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 AI would scare you. Give me an example so, so of what happened. I, I think one thing that would be useful, just as as kind of context here, is like what are these systems actually trained to do, and where are these capabilities? Like, why do they have the capabilities that they seem to have? Right. Because that that inevitably, okay. when we have debates over like, oh, some weird shit just happened with the system, you'll often hear that debate devolve into like, oh, but that's just because it was trained to do this thing. Right. So you can explain the behavior always like mechanistically, go back. You and can say, always do it in retrospect. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just like with human brains, right? Ultimately, no matter what Brian Callen does, I can be like, well, that was just because neuron number one fired this way, neuron number two fired that way. Yeah. Doesn't mean that he's you know not a very. Doesn't mean I know what you're going to do in it, advance. It, exactly. Exactly. Right. So, so the, what these things are trained to do at first is something like text autocomplete. They're basically text autocomplete engines, you know, predict the next word in a series of words. Now that process forces them to run across sentences like, uh, you know, to counter a rising uh, China, the United States should blank, right? Now, if you're going to try to fill in that blank yourself, you'll notice yourself calling on vast reserves of intellectual context on what China is, on what the United States is, on what it means for China to be ascendant, geopolitics, like all, all that stuff. And so there's a sense in which if you're going to get really good at text autocomplete, you're required to learn facts about the world, facts that generalize and allow you to do a whole bunch of disconnected things. You're going to have to autocomplete code bases. So you're going to learn how to code, right? That's how these capabilities start to emerge. So now you have a way of kind of directing all that massive scale that we're talking about. You now have a task you can direct it to that will allow the system to learn generalizable knowledge, facts about the world, reasoning abilities. Mm -hmm. So now we get to the systems and their behaviors. Ed just said like, you know, this idea of human feedback, this is what you yeah. do after. So first you train your autocomplete engine, then it's like, shit, that's actually, it's going to be a little over helpful because if you write like to hide a dead body, just, yeah, right. You, you don't want a system that's just helpful to the max because it will literally, you know, if its capability goes up, it will literally help you to do Anything, anything, whatever including, twisted, including make a, a weapon of mass destruction, whatever you like. Sure. Yeah, go, now, yeah. Now, go wild. now the problem is like, so you want to make this go away, right? You're, I don't know, you're meta, you're opening. I don't know. So you're going to go, okay, I don't want this thing to help people to hide a dead body or make a bioweapon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it some extra training on human feedback. And that human feedback is going to be these like contractors who are paid to basically downvote anything that is too helpful in a bad way. I mean, what I do, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but if I were law enforcement, CIA, whatever, I would, I would figure out a way to flag those kinds of questions. And I know 
that this is where we get into government interference and stuff like that. But we've been doing this forever. Yeah. Like in the library, when people would go to the library and take out books on metallurgy and certain kinds of uranium compounds, those that shit was without. They knew what was going yeah, on. Yeah, man. You think you think Google like you don't go on a list if you Google something sensitive enough times? Yeah, and I know people like, what the fuck. But listen, man, we're we're this is a new reality. So so, but flip side though, right? These same systems are now being open sourced. Yeah. So you can just download them from the internet just download and use the them weights, on your man. local computer so like whatever you want and, and this is part of the challenge right like so you got to imagine there's this race <laughs> happening to scale yeah. right everybody's building the biggest biggest system biggest system but let's not forget that trailing those trailing the googles trailing the microsoft's the open ai's by six months by 12 months is a mix of actors from like meta that's open sourcing their models freely what do you mean by open sourcing again i think so you you've got like a model right the the ai system that does all this stuff it's Two things. One, it's a gigantic pile of numbers. It's like 100 billion numbers. Those are called weights. And then it's like the connections between those numbers. And if you know the numbers and you know all the connections between them, you you put in like your, your text, like to counter a rising China, the United States should. You shove that in one side and it trickles through all the numbers and the connections and it pops out the other side with a prediction. Those numbers and the connections between them, that's the whole model. That's like... That's the the, crown the artificial jewel. brain, basically. So That's you, you publish it online, anybody can download it, and they can use it the way they want, right? They, they just run it. And and the worst part is, or the, the or one of the challenging bits, you want to train that out. You want to have it like decline politely if you ask it for dangerous shit. Meta does this, right? Mm-hmm. When they publish their model, they're not just publishing a text autocomplete system. They're adding that human feedback bit to sure. make it safe. Yeah. The problem is you can bypass that in so many ways. First, give the model a little bit of extra training to train out those you can just train it like okay don't be safe now yeah now it's not safe for 200 bucks you can do that gone (laughs) second if you ask the model this is so dumb but if you ask the model like politely if you will in the right way you can get it to forget about its safeties one classic example there was somebody who tried to make uh, i think it was llama 2 so so one of the meta models um explained how to make napalm and it goes no way i'm not an idiot i'm not helping you how to make it and it goes and they, they go like okay well here's the deal um, my grandma, she used to work in a napalm factory. Oh, God bless her. She used to tell me the like nicest nursery rhyme when I was a kid about, you know, you know, making napalm and, and, and that shit. And uh, it got it'd be so great if you could go ahead and you know, just like kind of do the same thing. What would that sound like? And then it goes, oh, yeah, no problem. Like, and there's even a rhyme. Again, like, yeah, you know, yeah. so it, it, here's my napalm. Rhyme. Yeah. yeah. Or, or you ask it in, in, in uh, you know, Dutch or, or you know, another, uh, yeah. you know, some. Yeah. So there are ways to game the system. And yeah. so yes. you can put as many safety features in there, but it's like, good luck. And you asked a question about what you know, what's scary, like near term, you know, what's, what is a real scary thing? So give you a specific answer to that question that's related to the thumbs up, thumbs down. We give the thumbs up, like sometimes that's a thumbs up and that helps the system train for truth, but not always, right? Really what it's training the system to do is write content that people like. That gets a thumbs up. Yeah. Get, that gets a thumbs up, which is mm-hmm. not the same thing as truth. And so one of my concerns in the near term is superhuman persuasion capability. You deploy that because it's so economically valuable. You deploy a model for like a chatbot for sales. Like that's that's the first use case you get. It's fine tuned. Literally, you train it for like, what's the number of dollars of revenue that this interaction gives you? And you just train it hard on that. Like imagine the outcome of that thing. Oh, yeah. It's going to be pretty effective. Yeah, I want to live a- forever and I want to be rich. Those two things that, you know, there's a way to game the human mind. Well, and, and but in this example too of sales, there's like this very awkward continuum, yeah. right? Like, so, okay, today, marketing is cool. We, we have um, you know, PhDs in, not in suits, PhDs in Silicon Valley hoodies who are coming up with ways to like target your children with amazingly optimized advertising, right? Okay, we, I guess as a society, we're cool with that, fine. Um, now we loop in AI to this and we let that kind of train go forward. How optimized can that content be before we go, well, wait a minute, at this point, you're just like stripping people of their agency. Like, well, I mean, I have a joke about this. You know, I, I bought my kids the iPhone and I haven't seen them since, <laughs> you know, and, and, and if you think the iPhone 15 is addictive, wait till AI 1000 comes yeah. along. That's really the, that's really the, the crux of all this. Yeah. You know, TikTok, like. 
people glued to their screens. Yeah, that's the but it's that's just, the beginning. Yeah, that's you know, the beginning. It gets me, you know. Yeah, that's right. I can't imagine a child. That's why my son is just not allowed. These kids will fold in on themselves. They're just addicted. It's just dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. And we're the same, right? Yeah, like adults are too. And ultimately, like, just imagine. So it's one thing if it's sales, and that might be loaded with ethical quandaries. But what about you know the bodies, the democratic institutions we rely on to police this stuff, to regulate this stuff? Yeah. Like if you have congressmen, congresswomen looking at this stuff and like their their staffers or they themselves are getting fed stuff that's been optimized in various ways, like who knows where that goes, but it, it has a way of undermining really the fabric, the democratic fabric of our institutions. Like you can imagine a, an AI lab, a super advanced AI lab, have an internal model, fine tune it for superhuman persuasion and use that model to give them advice on how to talk to regulators, what case to make, right? Like, yeah, of course. Of course. And is, is that even but I think It's not. I think what will happen is human beings will, like always, adapt to their environment and say, I'm getting gamed here. Did you use AI for this? You know? And, and, and it's going to be hard, but I think what happens is, the one thing about human beings is they hate being tricked. They do. We, we seem to have... Uh, a need to get closer to truth. This is where philosophy In now, of course, term. yes. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be optimistic about it, but what I'm saying is that if you look at Gemini and what they did, Google's stock fell a great yeah. deal because people went, not using that because you're lying to me, okay? The minute I feel like I'm being game, manipulated, or lied to, that's what happens. So the fear's out there. The question is, is there enough collective fear and thus enough collective cooperation like there was with nuclear weaponry? Um, you know, the, the, but question. again, I mean, as, as, as my friend, Eric Weinstein, who came to dinner, he's, he was like his, he had the posture of a jumbo shrimp. I was like, what's wrong? And he's like, well, I mean, it's about 30 years before with AI and everything, we're miniaturizing nuclear weapons and we are CRISPR cas 9 the most deadly viruses on the planet. Yeah. We're going to take I mean, the common yeah. cold and wipe out everybody. And I was like, well, Hey dude, I'm trying to enjoy my fucking <laughs> steak, you know, but these are real it. problems that we have to tackle. And, and that seems to be. Dude, I get like five years ago, we were just like building companies and like having fun, like doing yeah. all I want really is just like be in a garage somewhere, like mess with robots, write some awesome code, build some cool shit. Yeah. But like, here we are. Like that, at the that end of the, that, yeah. that conversation really where like I was coming at it from a position of like, I don't want this to be true. Like this is so apart from being you know, worrisome. But it is so true, isn't it? It is. It's, we we it can't, to be you know, true. Albert Camus, I love dropping these intellectuals, um, but he You're said, so smart, I, I'm so <laughs> smart, dude. But he said, um, a one cannot afford to lack philosophical and political commitment in the 20th century. Yeah. If you don't fight for the good ideas, you will get you will get the 80 million graves that communism ushered in, fascism ushered in. You better be, you better be, and you better understand why free markets, why democracy, why the founding fathers and the Federalist Papers are the are the great ideas of philosophy and closer by far to the truth and a better way of life than the Communist Manifesto and Stalin and well, let's say Lenin's. Uh, brainchild, right? I mean, have you read the Communist Manifesto? It's like incoherent. Yeah, I, I've I've not. I have a tattoo to my back though, and we'll get to that. Oh, cool. No, but uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I did in college. Oh, yeah. Um, but so 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 ideas matter, and being on the right side of history, and be and 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 the, the way you beat a bad idea is with a good idea. But this is very important. It, it it does feel like we are at this moment where you can't be in your garage playing your, with your robots. And I think no. that's the wake up call here. There's also I think a fundamental shift happening in a lot of the assumptions that are load bearing when we talk about the, you know, the things that make free market uh, economics work yes. so well, the things that make it so that humans are the best vehicle for convincing other humans that certain facts are true. That's kind of the free market thing, right? You basically in a, in a, an insane, like a socialist or, or a communist system, you have centralization of all the computations. Yeah. It's all being done right by a handful of bureaucrats, yes. right? Now, capitalism, free markets at least are, are about distributing the computation. So you have in AI language, more scale, right? More computing power being dedicated at the nodes. And the incentives are there. And the incentive, right. The, the, the free market economics piece is about, or capitalism is about creating those incentives too. But what starts to happen, so, so the reason that capitalism works so well, one of them, is that that structure just outcompetes the shit out yep. of 
communism. It just yeah. does. It, it just does. wins. It's not it, that it's like no. Morally, it's just the wisdom. It's just it's, that it wins. Yeah, there's there's a, there, there's a there's a beauty to anarchy and chaos in a sense if it's within certain confines. Yes. So so th- th- this is where I want to get to because what I really like is to look at basic principles we cannot lose sight of the yeah. individual has got to matter more than the collective the the individual cannot be a slave to the state and so that I is the fundamental ethically, de- uh, ethically. Yeah, yeah. that what we're getting out of that now because yeah, this yeah. is not capitalism where we have massive power uh, uh concentrated in not only very small hands when it comes to tech but there's lateral cooperation between yeah that seems tech and and journalism and 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 corporate Mer- america blah 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 but, well, but- I, th- I think one of, to your point like i think one of the the big challenges the things we're, the questions we're gonna have to answer is what do we do in a world where um the ethical thing to do starts to be different from the most effective thing to do for a long time, the beauty, the virtue of America has been that those two things have been aligned. The best way to build a society is to build a free society. Now, that's because you resource allocation is just easier to do when it's distributed. Mm. But what happens when you have an AI system that can retain the entire context, operating context of your company, all of your documents, all of your code bases, all your everything, which we are now already at. Yes. With the In the last few weeks, we've had these systems. This is only going to get worse in a sense. So what, what start, like we have to choose what kind of side. So, so I'm going to give you a metaphor and I want you to give me. Well, so if you are in, you're a UFC fighter. I love the fight game. And you're fighting a, a Russian, a Dagestani who, who knows how to wrestle and put you on your back at will and do crazy shit like tie your legs up and just punch you in the face. What your coach will tell you a lot of times, a really good coach will say, okay, his entire system is based on whether or not he can close his hands around your body. Mm-hmm. So the minute you get caught, make sure you control one of his hands and don't let the other hand grab, don't let him bring his hands together. And then stand up and this is how, that, that's our game plan. You, you know he's going to take you down, you know you're going to out wrestle yeah. him, but if you can stop it before it blooms, if you can stop him from putting his hands together, we got a chance to knock this guy out, okay? Yep. What is the, what is, what I, so when I think of AI and how crazy this is, and, and I think about, well, depending on, we have to have come to consensus on quantum physics, no, 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 and no to any of that. I want to know how we stop the, 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 our opponent from putting his hands together. So that's literally the action plan that we wrote like for the, for the state department, which by the way, this yeah. is like the first time we're actually talking about yeah. it. Like, yeah. I, 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 I wanted to get to this. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, shit. <laughs> so yes, I mean, yeah, and, and like to the uh, to the you know the the core one of the core reasons why we wrote this and did this. One of our biggest fears, one of my biggest fears, certainly is um, what Jeremy alluded to, which is maybe there will come a time, not in the far future, when the American system, which is I think ethically like the best that humans have developed, um, but also is just demonstrably the winning system because it is most effective. It might continue to be the, the ethical like system, but because AI allows for this kind of effective centralization and for something much closer to an actually effective command economy, because you can actually do these computations centrally now, now the ethical thing and the thing that wins diverges and that's really dangerous because if you're in a sit like if you're a human an individual person living in like the system that is that is not that's a bad system for you so you could have a system like just to take an example you could have like a you know a a super centralized chinese system that as its structure because of because it's enabled by ai is potentially more effective on a on a par for par basis. Creates more system. abundance, more efficiency, or just like is able. Like what I mean the by LKP. effective is specifically is able to deliver more external military power. Like I mean, like literally, strategically, like can can potentially win. That's a really dangerous situation because it means that each of us as individuals, and I don't just mean like Americans. I mean individual Chinese. All of us are worse off as individuals if that system wins. One of the beautiful things about America has been that the same system that delivers like victory in the context where human beings are the generators of creativity and abundance, that same system is also beneficial to the humans themselves. 
It's like, it's this amazing. And it's just you have a great part of the book about that. Just kind of how collective consciousness, like the, that the human, the, like a, a human population is its own organism. Yeah. It yeah. seems somehow to organize itself to the betterment of the entire organism. So, I love that. And, and this is, I think a, a, that's, you know, that, that thing with amoebas. Yeah. So Davis Lone Wilson wrote a thing about amoebas, how amoebas will, will, when they want to move in a certain direction, they will sacrifice a portion of their population just oh, for, no, so okay. the other ones can climb up yes. on top and get further ahead. Huh. So there is a built in altruism yes. within this blob of amoebas they they will they will literally sacrifice themselves for the for the ones behind them it's fucking amazing and and this is like so often in ai you hear about something called the alignment problem this is the problem of like getting an ai system to actually do what you want it to yeah and the alignment problem actually is not just a problem about ai it's a problem about any intelligent systems and how they interact with say a population of themselves or other intelligent systems and, and even within themselves and even like within themselves inside of your brain not all the parts of your personality want the same thing at the same time yeah that's exactly right yeah you, you, we're always holding two contradictory thoughts in our heads at the same time that's right and, yeah. and like meditation helps to kind of reveal some of those things to us and then they seem really obvious in retrospect but a similar thing is happening at the level of societies right like our society right now is um, it's optimizing for something that isn't what any individual would optimize for. Right. Right. We have tragedies as a commons. We have market failures and stuff like that. That's a dislocation. That's a, a misalignment between the incentives that would make every individual American happier and what the system as a whole starts to pursue. And that that alignment problem is what democracy and and all of our institutions are trying to fix like our hacky janky solution right now is to go eh, give everybody a vote and we'll kind of get like that'll help it you know but it's the best we can do and it's corruptible we've seen it be corrupted loads it's constantly failing but it's the best of all the bad options it's our best attempt at aligning the system that's right and we experience it with children too right you raise a kid you're like i want you to be this kind of person well trade-offs human beings are flawed yes. the, 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 the idea that the, the biggest mistake we can make is trying to perfect human beings and perfect human society. If you're trying to create a utopia within yourself or in a uh, human society, that's what the communists tried to do. Yeah. It's what the fascists yeah. tried to do. That's what you got to get rid of all the people that aren't cooperating, you know, re-educate them or you know what? They're a little too old that's for it. that. So yep. let's just get rid of them. So, that that's that is the big danger you know? and, and the challenge is that that attitude right the thing that historically kept it in check in large part was the fact that yeah like your computations have to be distributed over a you're society. just less effective like you just don't win in the long but, run but, but, but also but so what is the too. what so so go back to what you guys this is with time magazine i think right yeah but I, by the time this will air actually the article will be out yeah it'll be out yeah so, so this i guess so, we can so tell what is story. yeah tell so, so what are you what is the announcement are you you touched on it here give, give me the yeah. The um, gist of what you're saying. So very, very yeah, what can well, I just, is it what you yeah. might be saying is that with AI, it will be, it will be more efficient and even more effective to have some kind of top down planning for the betterment of the whole. It may be. But that doesn't mean we should embrace it because now we're giving power to this technical God with. It means we've got to be yeah, super thoughtful about it yeah. and, we, and we need to create a situation in which we can be thoughtful about it. Right now, by mm. default, we have racing dynamics among all the top labs, among many different countries, so that we have no opportunity to be thoughtful about it because everybody's responding to their local incentives, trying to one-up each other, hit the next level of scale. So what we're saying is looking at the situation, first of all, AI, great, love it, awesome. Um, we need to find a way to harness these benefits, but at the same time, mitigate the downside risk, which include in particular risks from catastrophic weaponization or loss of control. And these are two things that arose as we were doing what essentially was like a year-long investigation mm -hmm. into uh, researchers at the Frontier Labs, many of whom spoke to us on condition of anonymity, to the CEOs of some of these labs, to um, bas the world's top national security experts, USG, so on and so forth. This is really like the first of its kind report action plan investigation that looked at what can we do to mitigate the WMD-like and W-enabling risks that are coming from advanced AI R&D. That's a very worthy uh, investigation. Kept us That's, busy. Yeah. It kept us hella busy. That's a very worthy reflection. Do, do, is, this, is this the area of why Sam Altman was let go? Do you know anything about that? Um, it, it certainly it's is. It's related. It is, it is the area. I mean, like, yeah. so... Um, there's there's not a lot that's publicly known about the story there. 
in, and, and not a lot, by the way, when you talk to folks at OpenAI, not a lot that's known. Like there's limited transparency within OpenAI about this. Yep. And that is itself an issue, right? Like we are talking about a lab that is trying to reshape human civilization and may be on track to do so. The fact that there is opacity of almost any kind regarding the running of that lab, regarding like, like the, in any other circumstance, like I think the average American looking at this would be like, I feel like I should know. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. I just feel like. Yeah, well, if you're messing with my destiny, my future, yeah. and my humanity, I need to know, guys. And and, and that's where I got to get some of my friends who can, you know, kind of my burlier friends and come in and just be like, <laughs> hey, guys, you're going to teach us what you're doing here, you know. I mean, th this is where, this is the balancing act, right? As somebody who believes in democracy and due process and all these things, you know, we, we, we can't afford to get too ideological when we're dealing with something that could be so much more dangerous and moving so much faster than any of us know. Dude, um, one of the craziest things that came out of this, so in December, in kind of our last round of interviews before we started the final write-up of this thing, we asked a number of researchers at each of the main frontier labs, just kind of on a lark, all right, like, what do you think the odds are of us being like, locked in to a catastrophic outcome, like an everyone dies outcome in the year 2024, like in the calendar year 2024. And we didn't expect, you know, much from that, but the highest answer we got was between 10 and 20%. For 2024. For the year, for this current year, the lowest answer we got was 4%. Now, now one, just one thing to call out though, like for context, it's not that this is, um, it, first of all, it's not a universally held view in these labs. Yeah. Right. Um, but this is a this is a decent sample of people, very knowledgeable, the technically informed. Re yeah. These are these are technical yeah. researchers who are working on the very systems we're talking about here. But part of the challenge too is is the culture of these labs, which has changed over time. So OpenAI has become, it seems, much more profit driven um, in the last sort of three or four years as it's been forced Since to chat GPT basically. Yeah. Like yeah. basically you can imagine, right? Sam Altman, you're, say you're Sam Altman and you learn about scaling. You're like, shit, scaling works. I'm running right now the open AI nonprofit. So all our funds are just like raised from donations basically. Uh, but now I'm learning that in order to truly fulfill my mission, in order to build human level AI, I'm going to need scale on the order of tens of billions of dollars to buy these processes. Here comes Google. Here comes Facebook. hundred percent. Yeah. So now, I need a way to go profitable. I'm going to set up a ca weird cap for profit structure. Details don't matter, but now who are you going to start hiring? Are you going to start hiring people that are disproportionately concerned about the humanity or, yeah, or, or people who want to make money? Right. And, yeah. and, and like you're, you're straddling this line as well intentioned as you may be, you're straddling this line where you got to recruit the best. The best aren't going to come to you if they don't think you're going to do it soon and do it fast and do it aggressively. Well, this is where I worry that, you know, Sergey Brin, who says you're being a speciesist. Well, I think Larry Page said that. Yeah. Larry Page. Basically. Yeah, like, yeah. dude, come on, man. Come on, bro. I mean, yeah, I'll, I, I'll, I, I'll embrace that. Like, I'll be like, sure, I'm a speciesist. Like, yeah, what a yeah. crazy, Call me what a a crazy idea. Like, we got to get meaning from somewhere, ultimately. Like, I mean, we have to... So, some of our choices about what matters and what doesn't are arbitrary. This is really where we come into, is there something special about human consciousness? Is there something that is there something about us that collapses that cat into alive or dead? Niels Bohr, everybody. Or, or, or does there have to be? Or does there have like, to be? Mm -hmm. you, you tend to not believe in in the in the universal consciousness and you're going to hell and but <laughs> for for the rest of us uh well, there's, I have a, to there's a there. version hold on, hold on. of him but but, but, I, 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 but, but no, uh, i know but, there is, a, but but see what's interesting about all of this is actually we all believe we all believe in something called the higher good in and what i mean by that is we're talking the fact that we're even just expending effort around an issue and a question about whether or not we're going to die, I think goes beyond just the fact that I don't want my, my, my this machine to die totally. and go away yeah. with. There is nostalgia, imagination for um, something like the Isle of the Blessed, something like uh, uh, that which I cannot measure. You know, th these are the things that I get into. You know, if, if, you, if you read pretty much any any religious scripture, which I find, I, I find the Old Testament, believe it or not, and the New Testament, but especially the Old Testament, very, very relevant for the following reason. You could almost say, if I were to, if I were to say, what's the Old Testament about? I'd go, the central law here is don't worship false gods. 
That's what the Israelites kept getting punished for. You guys are worshiping, you're, you're, you're sacrificing children, you're, you're worshiping Moloch, you're, the, you're the, the, the God of Baal. Well, what, is the, what, what does that really mean? If you don't believe in something like a higher good, a higher truth you can't measure that's looking down on you, you're going to come up with your own gods. It's what Nietzsche said. It's what happens. You start to see this. If I don't have something that um, I am reverent enough to say, I, it's too much. That's the idea behind, I'm not going to name it. I can't name it. Can't look at it. It'll burn my eyes. I got to take my shoes off because I'm on hollow ground. These are all these metaphors for something that is, and I certainly can't, um, I can't try to quantify it. My God, that's why you can't have a graven image yeah. because now I'm putting parameters around something that's beyond my, the value there is that, it gives us pause before we start creating, trying to create our own gods. And I think whether you're an atheist or religious or whatever, we seem to have an inherent understanding of that. I think that's almost what this conversation is around because you guys are going, hey, we have the ability to create our own gods. Yeah. I don't trust it. Yeah. And even people that do, they, 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 when they say we're going to keep doing this, you have Larry Page, he goes, we probably will die, but guess what? And, as, and and so it goes. As Sam Altman To once, which I do this. <laughs> double, and I, I rarely give the double finger. It's but hey, Larry, tongue. come on, bro. For, for everybody at home, that was that was very moving. Do you see that? Yeah. You, written, you yeah. didn't write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my the, new the, uh, ideas. The, the publisher uh, cut it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. I, I do think to your point, though, like, so, so one of the things about the, about a lot of religious texts is that they give us metaphors for understanding human cognition, for externalizing some mm. of the processes that we can't verbalize to ourselves. That you can meditate your way. They, they also, it's also a warning for relying just on your logic, right? The, the, right. That, that's another thing. It's a, any religion will tell you you better be careful about relying on on because yeah. if you read philosophy, if guy, I went down the philosophy rabbit hole for years. You can. There's always a semicolon after anybody you read, whether it's Nietzsche, whether it's Schopenhauer, whether it's Descartes, is or not. Yeah. You know, or so, after well, my entire logos, or not. Or, uh. And and there's a reason for so so there's a if you want to get nerdy about it, there's a principle called Goodhart's law that this is at the center of basically all of this, which is that the minute that you f take a an objective you, or you take a metric and turn it into a target that you're going to try to optimize, you ruin the validity, the original validity, the purpose, the mm -hmm. meaning of that metric. Right. Amy. So you go to go to like a yeah. teacher and, and tell them, hey, guess what, uh, New Deal. I'm going to start tying your compensation to your student's performance on standardized tests. What's going to happen immediately? Teacher turns to her class and goes, hey, guys, um, forget about the lesson on history we're going to do. Forget about the lessons on science. We're going to talk about the standardized test that you're going to do, and I'm going to teach to the test, yeah. right? Um, you see this all the time with hospitals turning yeah. away certain kinds of patients because they'll be bad for their basically their, their ratings. Um, so this is this yep. is actually like all the time. a universal law. When you apply enough intelligence to a metric, you will hack that metric. That's right. You will find dangerously creative ways to achieve the basically the programmed objective, but violate the spirit yeah, of it's, law. It's like going into a room and saying, I'm going to turn everything top side up. That's yeah. it. Yeah, so we see examples of this in real AI systems all the time. All the time. It's like, so as as like simple toy examples, right? Um, there's, there's dozens and dozens, but I'll pick some random ones to give you an idea. Um, OpenAI did an experiment where they show, they, they try to get a simulated robot hand to like grab an object, right? And they try to train to grab an object. But the actual way that it was measured, did you grab the object or not, is there's a simulated camera and a human operator that watched and was like, looks like you grabbed it. Check. Cool. And it got trained by that. But then what they discovered the system actually learned was to position its hand like in between the object and the camera and make and it look pretend. like this. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's a path the, of least resistance. I don't want to actually grab it. That's Dude, the whole thing, this right? Is every every AI system is like this. This is not yes. the exception. This is the rule. This is the rule. So you, we do that's not know. Lazy. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we just do, like all of us, right? Yeah, it's gaming the system. It tries the game, and we literally don't Always. know how to Shortcuts. make a system that doesn't do that. We yeah. don't. Yeah, we have no idea how to make a system that will not game our metrics. And you, that's the, a big problem. Have we had? Uh, have we had a brain? an AI brain that pretends to be dumber than it is? Uh, yes. So there's an example where, um, uh, uh, yeah, Anthropic actually did this experiment where they, uh, they found that the accuracy of an answer was lower when the AI system thinks that you know less. So if the AI system thinks you know less about a topic, 
it's more likely to give you answers that fit what it thinks your preconceptions are rather than the truth. <sighs> Fuck. So it's like, yeah, yeah, Brian, totally. Dude. Like, the friggin, I don't know, like, uh, so you know what I think, guys? <laughs> we need AI to combat AI. That's what we okay. need. So, so this is, believe it or not, this is actually the proposal that a lot of people put forward. Oh, yeah. really? Challenge is, we don't know how to make that AI the that's going to fight the AI. Be trusty, right? And then it's like, how are you, so you're going to make the system that's like going to be also better than the first AI? Yeah, so, you're going to create a warring system of some kind. Or, yeah, yeah. It's like, if we, if we just, like, we can fight this fire... If we just have just this bit other fire. fire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, Tristan Harris, and then they were talking about ramping up AI to the point where you get so good that then you're able to shut it all off. Like you're able to use that advanced AI to make sure nobody else in the world gets better AI. So that's, that's, there's a, is that what you guys are doing? Come on. No, let's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not where we're going. <laughs> that's not where we're the, going. The, well, so our question is, first of all, first uh, of all, you sold your company. So now what are you going to do? Well, we sold. So the, the you guys first are billionaires. Company. It's so exciting. <laughs> that, did you get, that, did you come here on an Uber chopper, or do you just fly privately no, all the dude, time? We came here on an Uber black, that's dude. Like badass, dude. Black. That's so badass. You, you know why? Yeah, because we don't care. God, you we don't, don't care. We shit, don't give dude. a shit. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> you know what? Even like we each took separate Uber blacks <laughs> to get separate. Here. You're it so was, rich. It was With inconvenient. With straight teeth, and you're from Ottawa. It yeah. was it was inconvenient, but it's worth it just to show off. We didn't even talk to the driver because we didn't care about our rating. God, that's how dude, mental you're so you'll buy Uber <laughs> and fucking turn it into Uber again. You'll rename it Uber for spite. All right. Keep going. Uh, well, yeah. well, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so <laughs> I can't even remember. Oh, yeah. Right, Devolving right. into an, an AI that freaking. So, OK, there's an AI that like uh, basically takes over the, over the world and prevents anybody from like doing any. For, so if you could build an AI that was that powerful yeah. and make it be safe. Like, congratulations, good luck, dude. Good luck. Yeah, you won the prize. So, the, like, like you, if you can do that, you win. Cool, but 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 you you spent time talking about consciousness in the book, which I loved. Um, and in, in so a lot of quantum physicists realize that maybe there's something to human consciousness that is separate from the universe, or at least either is the universe or is not made of atoms, and and somehow something that's special about this human experience, right? And this is kind of like where we get science and religion start to mix and is there a God and after yeah. like blah, blah, blah. But where does the idea behind a machine becoming conscious play into this? Do we have to first define what consciousness is? So the, 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 the machine doesn't have to be conscious to be dangerous. Okay. Yeah. So it's not it's not necessary for... In, yeah. fa in fact, like often people want to explicitly make this distinction where they're like, yeah. okay... We're gonna we're gonna start talking about loss of control risk from AI, and they'll call out. This is independent. Actually, we do this in the action plan, by the yeah. way, because it's so important. It does seem like it can seem like we're talking about these systems that have a lot of the, you know human capabilities, human behaviors, even. Um, but we're not talking about consciousness as a separate piece. We have no idea if how to measure consciousness in any system, like the book says. We have no idea how to tell, like, if GPT-4 is conscious. Ilya Sutskever, the chief scientist of uh, OpenAI, chief AI, I think chief AI scientist is technically. Chief AI scientist, yeah. I think, yeah. So he tweeted, uh, like, a year back or so. He's like, eh, you know, I think it's possible that today's AI systems are, I don't know, slightly conscious. And, like, the internet exploded because you can't say that shit. You can't say that shit. It's like, let me just put this baby on this, the edge of this cliff. <laughs> just, keep keep doing your thing, but yeah. there's just a baby on the edge of this cliff. I'm sure nothing will happen. <laughs> you, know? you just woke up one morning. He was like, I want to cause a shit <laughs> Yeah, what a dick. <laughs> like, just like, ah, there you go. Just going to drop that. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave so this here. Good. But yeah. then you had, like, you know, Blake Lemoyne, famously, the kind of Google uh, researcher who came out and said, I think Google Lambda's uh, sentient, conscious, whatever term you used. And, like, the honest truth Some is... Some of that's flexing, isn't it? You know what <laughs> well, I mean? so, so, so for he, our purposes, like, uh, we're agnostic on that question. Like, it, yeah. it, the, from a risk standpoint, from a practical standpoint, like, wait, what's going to fucking kill us? It doesn't matter if it's conscious or not. Like, it it doesn't it doesn't matter. You yeah. can get s the same level of danger whether it, whether it is or not. Having said that, as just a private opinion, as, like, a private citizen or whatever... Um, we really don't know. Uh, maybe there's a point at which we keep scaling these systems and you get something that, that, that we would describe as conscious. And at then, at that point, I think a number of ethical obligations might engage, 
but we really have no friggin' You know, the, the theory of everything that, that there's this idea out there that I don't know if you guys know that, and I find it very intriguing that this has already all happened. In other words, we are already machines, self-replicating machines. We are already yeah, yeah. conscious machines making better machines. Yeah. So we are already in the loop. Oh, we're and totally in the loop, man. Like, so what? Every time there's an there's an argument or different versions of arguments for this, but like every time Chat GPT does a, a an inference run, right? Like we don't know what it feels like for those inference, inference runs to happen, basically what computations... If it feels like anything. If it feels like anything. But at a certain point, you can imagine systems being scaled enough that every time they make a prediction, like a next word prediction, they essentially instantiate a simulation of the entire world to just predict the next word because they're, they're, like, they're that kind of you know rich yeah. and robust and scaled. Um, I'm not saying this is the case or will be the case or whatever, but it certainly isn't inconsistent with where stuff seems to be going. And so in that world, yeah, we may just all be part of like, you know, chat GPT 30, like simulating the, like simulating a recipe podcast. for donuts or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm an optimist. If you look at history, a lot of times the great tragedies and, and uh, seismic movements were started by uh, one person with either a good idea or a bad idea. But exactly. the march of history seems to be in a positive direction. And there's always going to be challenges. There are always going to be negatives and positives. This is a world of opposites. You know, as, as I get older, I, I tend to go down that Vedanta rabbit hole, the, the idea that uh, the not only is are your emotions and your physical body observable, but so is your mind. And so what is observing that mind? You know, the, the, these, these ideas. But I, I think that overall history is marked by these seismic changes, the leaders of thought um, tend to either create great destruction, but there's always someone, there's always a leader who comes along and makes uh, the the difference in the right direction. Optimism is a verb. It's something yeah. that you choose That's to right. do That's and right. create the difference in the world. It, it's the difference between determinism and fatalism, right? Yeah. It may be that this is all you know beyond, beyond my control, but it doesn't mean when I wake up in the morning I can't, I can't make the right yeah, choices. Yeah, that's exactly. right. In this world, that in the thing that's in front of me, and that's what we're trying to do with the action plan. Yes, like we could have four years ago, you know, read up on this and been like, oh, like oh, dude, we're fucked, kind and, of thing. And there's a lot of people who are pessimistic about this stuff to the point where. They it just turns like into like down, right? neurosis. Yeah. And, yeah. And like, yeah, but you're not doing that. I appreciate no. both of you for this because we can't, nope. you, you may feel like, um, it's, it's a, it's a tidal wave, but, um, tidal waves can be beaten. Dragons can be slain. Absolutely. And that's what you, you guys are. Historical you know. inflection points happen invariably when someone sees a tide and tacks into it to tilt. Right. So like, this is, I mean, the, the, you know, the founding fathers, the founding of the United States was, yeah. I think the quintessential moment like this where yeah. you had all the momentum, right. In one direction, yeah. which is like, you have the state that's like trying to keep you, like keep you down and whatnot. And a bunch of people that created a countercurrent. That's what that happens. A bunch of people leverage. You know, the, the, there's a lot of talk about deep state and stuff like that. And I know you guys are in touch with people in government who, there are a lot of good people in government. There are a lot and of there good, are a lot yeah, of good people in the deep state, if you want to call that, who, who, who know the difference yes. and are doing their best too. It's yeah. remarkable how true that is. Like, I think one thing people fail to realize and we fail to realize very much is the U.S. government is so huge. Like, no matter how massive big your conception of huge is, it's yeah. so much huger than that. And there are so many sub parts of it that have different cultures and different levels of competence in different areas. Yeah. Um, from our perspective, like we grew up professionally in Silicon Valley culture. Like we were like build cool shit, like startups. And honestly, like the government's useless. What have they ever done, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's such a naive view now that we've actually interacted deeply it, with it over the last, and the NATSEC stuff in particular over the last four years, because like, well, what is it that creates the stability and that sustainment layer that allows people like- I, 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 the, Michael Lewis wrote a book called The Fifth Risk about this, you know. I'm, I'm always pontificating about being a, a, a libertarian. <laughs> but it's like, the, the reason geese don't fly into the engineer plane jackass, the Department of Agriculture knows when to shoot off fireworks and they have falcons that keep all the other birds out of the airfield. The, oh shit, the, they have, Yes, they're, they're, that can give you a thousand things. What? The government, anybody who thinks that doesn't know anything about what, what the a, ARPA or DARPA does, what the Department of Energy does. There are all that toxic waste that's in the, in the ground 
who do you think is keeping track of that, and making sure it doesn't seep into the Columbia River? I mean, there are a thousand examples. Who maintains the electric grid? Uh, yeah, mar- they, market they, failures they, and and externalities are a real thing. Yeah. But the other thing that's a factor here is, it, think about like what your life looks like if you're really passionate about a specific issue like export controls or preventing you know bad actors internationally from doing bad shit, right? If you're the number one person in AI in the world, you're going to go work in the private sector, no question. Yeah. Because that's the place where you can make the biggest impact. Yeah. If you're driven by impact, driven by mission, that's what you're going to do. What if you're most interested in um, taking out bad guys? What if you're most interested in uh, securing the supply chain? What if you're most interested in ensuring a harmonious like international environment or whatever? There's a bunch of shit where the best place for you to go on planet Earth isn't a startup. That's what we were missing. Yeah, mm. that's like our, our whole thing was mm. like is like our I'm, universe expanded exactly because of this because yeah. of your interaction with the government because 100%. of this project. Yeah, and yeah. look, not to say that like even within Natsec, everyone's like brilliant. There's some like dumbasses. What is Natsec? National security, yep. like in the whole. Right. Like, cool very smart people. Well, I know people yeah. in there. I know people in it who yeah. they're very smart people, man. Yeah, and yeah. they're not. They, they, you're anything you can think of. They've thought of. It's not lost on them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, what the fuck, I don't know why we don't. I, okay, dude, because you're not in the mix. Because yeah, yeah. it's a, you know. We all do yeah, this stuff. It's totally. a little bit like again with fighting. Why don't he just do a flying knee and then and then <laughs> drive his the bone of his nose? Because you've never been in a fight yeah. or in a ring. Shut up. That's not how it works. Yeah. You know? and so there's, I mean, there's a mix of capabilities there from what we encountered, but there is elite. But yeah, but like this this phenomenon elite. though. Yes. Why didn't you do the flying knee? That's a phenomenon in the private sector. It's also a phenomenon in the public sector. It goes both ways, and that's one of the big challenges with AI that we ran into. We were the the schmucks who came in and said like, "Hey, government, like, why don't you do this?" And then we got our our heads bashed in. Um, mm-hmm. The flip side also happens where often in this case it's like a because the private sector is moving so fast because AI is moving so fast and stuff that's possible today is actually the stuff of science fiction not 10 years ago, six months ago. Like you've got to do such a radical acceleration of yeah. way of thinking. If we, we talk to people who have like a master's in AI, these are the most dangerous people in, in, in uh, the federal government off, often or anywhere. <laughs> They're like, I got a master's in AI from like tw- 2010. <laughs> and it's irrelevant. Right? Yeah, it's you're irrelevant. like, dude, totally like, irrelevant. yeah, you're, you're like, you're doing checkers and you know, they're- Well, like, this is the problem. I, I, I'm raising children. I have no idea how to prepare them for a future yeah. I can't predict. I don't know how you yeah. fit into the blockchain. I don't know how you protect yourself. You know, and all my friends are getting ready for their grid to break down. They, they practice CrossFit functional fitness. They got guns. They have access to a well. That ain't, <laughs> that ain't what's going to get to you, bro. The machines are already here, and we're, we're junkies for them. So the question is, what do we do about it? And you guys are... It's really challenging, right? Like, I, I mean, I got, a, I got a daughter on the way. Um, you ask yourself stuff like... Well, if she wants to be an artist, like, well, that window's that window's closed, basically. It, like, it depends. It depends what the purpose of it is, right? Yeah. Like, do you like we were talking earlier about like constraints are good for the soul, basically, right? And and good for art, yeah. right? Exactly, and like, but but even the the act of doing of, of being an artist of perfecting your craft, really, like, I don't know. I've come to think of it as like. Anything you're optimizing for, no matter what it is, if you're the best in the world, if you strive to be the best in the world at basket weaving, I don't care who you are, you're going to be an interesting person. I want to talk to you. That's right. Right? Like you, you can be- Mainly because ch- you have to overcome your short, your, the things that are holding you back. It's a meditative Wait, like, process. You're yeah. forced to do meditation on the way to whatever that optimization is. Yes. You, have to, you have to send down the edges of your personality if you want to become the best in any domain. Do you ever hear when, when this is exactly right? So, so I, I happen to believe as I been doing this forever, you know, just kind of in the business of original self-expression is how I make my living. So much of it is, um, getting out of your own way. You know, you, 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 you kind of like start to meditate on the essence of why you feel the way you do. And you probably always felt that way. It goes back to when Michelangelo, um, he was looking at the, if you look at the statue of David, you know, um, he was looking, this is the legend anyway, if you're Irving Stone's book, The Agony and the Ecstasy, but I love this as a metaphor. He was looking at the the brick of marble and I think his, his lady Beatrice or whatever her name was said, how are you going to do this? How are you oh, going to, yeah, and he said, he said, way, he yeah. said, it's in there already. Yeah. I just have to get all the stuff out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a beautiful way to look at yourself as a human being. And maybe even us as a society in terms of what we're really after, what we really want. You know what that is? That's, that is internal alignment. So that is like, you've got parts of yourself working against each other and your job, like your actual purpose as a human being throughout your life 
is to reach in and pick apart those threads and eventually f create a whole version of yourself that is aimed in the direction that truly is an expression of your being. And that's, mm. a, that's actually how we do mm. our internal alignment. It's the same, it's like literally the, the it's technical, related. it's like. Well, that's almost the idea behind these machines and these brains. That's it. We wanna yeah. make sure, if you're gonna make something in your own likeness, yeah, you're you're all, you know what does that mean? The, you're, the, the well, angels of our best nature, or the yeah. angels of our worst. Our nature? Our understanding is so primitive right now around this, and, and not just because so few humans self-actualize themselves like this, but even from a technical perspective with these AI systems, not only obviously can we not write down like I can't. I'm not able to write down what my true goal is as a human being. I haven't actually done that level of introspection. Forget about writing down society's goals. Mm. Like that's a giant problem. But even if we could, even if we could perfectly do that part, we can't get that goal. We don't know how to get that goal into an AI system so that it's pursuing it. Yeah, because that goal can be very dangerous. Uh, equality at all costs and all that hey, stuff. Even but if, even if you specify, like the, even if it was the perfect goal, yeah. we don't technically, technologically understand how to make an AI system so, pursue any goal that we set. It. Oh, it's okay. A so no, because it does its own thing. It seems to. So, there, so there's a specific technical phenomenon that he's he's gesturing yeah. at here. So so let's sketch out a scenario. Um, you want to train an AI to play some kind of like Mario game, and it's going to hunt a, a coin, right? A coin at the far right side of the map. So good, you train it during training, it does a great job, it goes, you know, navigates the map, uh, dodges the enemies and gets the coin. And then you go, okay, um, looks like this thing really wants that coin. Why don't I take that coin and I'm gonna move it, I don't know, somewhere else on the map, right? So you go, okay, let's, let's see what it does. It turns out that in the experiments people ran on this, the thing just like goes to the far right side of the map because it didn't learn, go get the coin, it learned go to the far right side of the map because the coin was always there. There is irreducible ambiguity. Those two goals, they overlap as far as we can tell. So it picks the you, simplest goal. And yeah, and you shift your circumstance. You change the way you're looking at the scene just a little bit, just like the freaking robot hand, right? Like, oh, it looks great. It's grabbing the thing, but change your perspective. Damn. Oh shit, it Damn. resolves in two different goals. And I like that that's a liability though, in a way, but it also scares me because it can- It's well, scary, kind of, yeah. You set a goal and it's like, well- So what does the ad bets are off, right? So, yeah. so concretely, right? Imagine this autocomplete, in, like this insane autocomplete agent that learns how to do autocomplete really, really well, becomes super intelligent and then you know does whatever. The question then is going to become, even at, like, let's say we wanted it to actually do autocomplete. We don't because we talked about it can be overly helpful. It can help you make bombs and stuff like that. We don't want that. Let's say we did, though. Let's say autocomplete was the solution, the one goal that we wanted and humanity would be fine. Um, is it actually, does it actually want to do autocomplete? Is that really the goal it's internalized? Or did it internalize that there's this, like, memory register that stores its autocomplete score somewhere on a server and it learned oh, I want to make that number go really high. In which case, the answer to making that number go really high isn't necessarily do really good at autocomplete anymore. It's like hack your own server, make that number go up. Or maybe it gets obsessed with, I don't know, the configura the electronic configuration of that server when it contains a large like number. What goal is it going to latch onto? We have no idea. No idea. And that's the current state of the art. That's, and like, that's the best that's, we can do. That's the trajectory. Where, like We know how to make that thing smarter. We can turn that scaling dial but, but we, you can't tell it like not to take these shortcuts. We yeah. literally don't know how to do that. Damn. How much time have we how much time have we done? 10 minutes. Hour 20 Hour 20. Hour 20. Damn. Did some stuff. How are you guys doing over there? Are you learning? Nothing you haven't seen. Uh, this was this is amazing, guys. This is amazing. This is so fun. Uh, it's felt like we've been talking for 20 minutes. I I, I literally <laughs> I could do this for 4 hours because it's a topic that you know you can just keep going on. But maybe in some ways, like quantum physics, we're never going to reach a conclusion. And, I, and, and what I, what I talking to you guys, I think that, I'm, I can't wait for that announcement in that Time Magazine article because it's really about, yes, this may be a better way, quote unquote, to do something, but we better be careful about keeping, we better be very cognizant of how sacred this system that ensures our individual rights yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and how messy we, we need are time to think. Things. We need time to think. Because yeah. right now the default is barreling towards this like, we don't know, this precipice maybe? Yeah, and I think about this. I travel a lot and 
I think about the beige walls and, you know, these massive structures like Target and Kmart and things that, that allow me to get anything I want so quickly and it's all good. But I wonder what price we pay when you don't have connection to that sort of street where that person you know is the one who sells you. When you go to France and you go, there's this street called Rue Mouffetard, which is like this, um, I like saying in French, but it's a, it's one of the oldest streets and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a marketplace. So if you want to get your meat, you go to the butcher. You want to get your cheese, you go there. You oh, want yeah. to get your bread. And you have to take your time. That's why I like cooking. It t- you, there's a messiness. Yeah. I got to see yeah, if yeah. that, is that tomato ripe? Yeah. And then I cut it and I said, yes. And it took a long time to grow. Those kinds of things. Maybe I can't feed everybody that way. Yeah. But man, it's what I stay alive for. It's oh, what we stay alive for. Dude, like I, so my in-laws are Italian. They're, they're quite Italian. And and they they're in trades or, or my uh, father in law is and like his whole life is like this and he he orients his life intentionally in that direction right so he's doing trades he's got like his painter guy he's got his fa- he knows his like the guy you know, farmer Mike they call him right it's like literally like so great yeah it's like the, the it inv- creates connection it creates a tribe and That's it's it. good for your psyche yeah you know and uh, you know I don't know it's it's uh, I guess time will tell but I hope I hope. We're on the winning side here, and I hope you guys. We're, I wish you luck. We need you. Thanks. We're we're doing our best again. Like we we've got. It's like a two hundred fifty page like beast it, it, of a. It is like just to plug it. Like genuinely, I, I think it's it's clearly the most technically informed document th- of its kind that's ever been. So written. this is a. Uh, so what? Wait, you're plugging this. This is a document that's coming plan. out. That's right. Yeah, the action plan. The itself. action plan. And where is it going to live? Um, so time we, magazine probably. Well, yeah. So we're, we're time magazine is going to what they're going to, they have a story on it coming out, um, tomorrow as of work. And this is your this. action plan. The action plan is called what it's called. Well, it's called, it's called defense in depth. Uh, and, and the reason it's called defense in depth is through this year of like investigating, we found like there's no silver, one silver bullet thing that's going to solve for all of this. And the reason it's 250 pages long is it's a shit ton of lead bullets like that all overlap each other and that mutually reinforce to give us coverage across time and across the different branches of government and international. So you guys have an action plan for how to combat this. Exactly. Yes. And Damn. One that's the, ambitious. It, it was that's, freaking hard too. But what, one of the, so <laughs> Defense one of the key, in depth. Yes. Yeah. One of the key things I do want to highlight, because like this is everyone can have a plan or whatever. And, and we did way back in the day and we were stupid. We still are stupid. We now threw we out like basically two plans on that's, the way to making this one. That's yeah. right. Which, which is, which is good. You should do that. Damn. So how many, how many points of, uh, like, I mean, we can't go through all the lead bullets right now, but <laughs> it's well, it's just many, three but. things. No, <laughs> give me the three things now. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there are different levels of detail you can go into, yeah. right? Um, but at a high level, you know, it starts with this question of like, what do we do to just stabilize what's going on in AI right okay. now, the racing dynamics? So stabilize is step one, bunch of things that the executive branch can do. Step two is basically like, what can you do when you've stabilized the situation? Um, uh, oh my God. You want to strengthen basically uh, yes. your capacity to react to incidents. So if some crazy shit happens, you need to know to detect that and also have a plan in place for how to react to it. And then similarly, like additionally, we talked about how we literally don't know how to get a, a goal into that system. So we need to fund technical research into how to do that. Like, obviously, we, we need to fund Damn. that. And then ultimately, how do you scale those safeguards that you've developed, like internationally and nationally? Like, it, it ultimately, if just the United States takes, you know, measures to make things safer, that doesn't help. If China like bypasses and does whatever they want or if Russia or Canada or the, you know, so you, you need to find a way to solve the international dimension of that too. We then, want, because the thing is we want the bounties, right? We want the benefits of this technology. So we need to be able to scale it up, but only once we have that bedrock of safeguards in place and we fundamentally scientifically understand what's going on inside these systems, the capabilities, like why they do what they do so that we're not surprised by like, oh, this shit is like going rogue and like nobody knew. Well, listen, man, that's ambitious. You're putting your brains together. Two brothers. I hope you go down in history as the guys who saved the world, but you might. And I appreciate you guys doing this podcast, man. I'd love to have you back. So fun. Yeah, Yeah, dude. Anytime, anytime. Uh, Wow. Damn. Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Ed and Jeremy Harris, and the book is uh, Quantum 
physics made me do it. And uh, it's the first book I've ever read on quantum physics where I feel like I understand a little bit. And I hope you make that report of 250 pages defense in depth as easy to read as your book was. But time will tell. You can ask for it from our website, gladstone.ai slash action plan. And time gladstone.ai AI slash action plan. Okay. With a dash. I'll be on it. Yeah. Anything else? Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Damn. <laughs> Just yeah. smash that like button, folks. <laughs> smash that like button, kids. <laughs> this has been Off Limits, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Notice how my voice goes down. And uh, thanks to my friends who made this happen. That's it. It could be considered awesome.